How does one company get 300,000 plus professionals in 150 countries to work together? With ServiceNow workflows, Deloitte seamlessly connects professionals across the globe on the Now platform. ServiceNow workflows provide Deloitte professionals consistency and agility worldwide, which makes it that much easier for Deloitte to thrive and to adapt to whatever change the marketplace throws their way next. Whatever your business is facing, let's workflow it. Learn more at servicenow.com. Ten, nine, eight. Ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Entered Untold Radio AM. And now broadcasting from a secret location, your hosts, Joel Sturgis and Doug Hychek. And welcome to this edition of Untold Radio AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis. Right along with me is Mr. Doug Hychek. Doug, how you doing tonight? Doing good. Yeah? Yeah, it's summerish out there. I say ish because up here, <laughs> it's cold. I don't know about where you are. Yeah, it is real cold. Like they're talking snow cold. Yeah, it went from ninety to the fifties. Yeah. yeah, then the door slammed, and boy, did it slam hard. <laughs> slammed it right on my toe is what it did. It was horrible, horrible. So wherever you are, I hopefully it's much warmer than fifty degrees. So you know. We got a great show on tap tonight. In fact, we're going to be bringing our guest in early here. But uh, many of you guys, um, everybody is familiar with, and if you haven't been familiar with it, you need to pause this. We've been listening via podcast. Pause us now. Run and watch or read or do whatever. Fire in the sky. Then come back to us. <laughs> and now through that magic of podcasting, you have now watched Fire in the Sky. So you're caught up. Our guest tonight is Mike Heston Rogers. He was involved in the famous Travis Walton UFO incident. Mike was Travis's boss of the Timber Stand Envir- Environment Crews crew at Snowflake, Arizona in 1975 when Travis Walton was seemingly taken aboard a strange, unidentified UFO and was missing for days. In this untold Radio AM episode, we will hear Mike's unique take on what he saw, felt, and did during that strange night and the, th- and, and the tough days that followed. Because if you watch the movie, you're going to have an idea of the kind of tough days that did follow. And we're going to hear direct from Mike tonight. This was the most witnessed, investigated, and researched abduction in history. A little bit about Mike. Mike was born, of course, in Snowflake, Arizona. And he would have been born in March, March 4th, 1947. The year the UFO era began, Mike said he had an absolutely ideal childhood. His grandfather, Roger, had a large farm, and his other grandfather, Howard, had a sizable ranch, both on the west side of town. Mike graduated from Snowflake Union High School and then started working in the nearby forest. Three years later, he started college, but then regretfully got married. After 12 years and six kids, six kids, Mike, my gosh, and then divorcing, unfortunately. Mike finally went back to college uh, on and off for many years. On November 5th, 1975, he and five others witnessed an object that apparently snatched Travis Walton away in 1993. Fire in the Sky was made that night. Welcome to the show. I got to say, welcome to the show, Mike. Mike (laughs) Rogers, everybody. So that's... That's nutshell, but we're going to go much deeper there. Right, Doug? <laughs> yeah, well, I hope so. So how thank, you doing? thank you, guys. How you doing, Doug, Joel? Uh, I'm doing, doing great. fine. I'm, I'm always doing finer doing fine. than frog hair. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you can say that. I'm happy as a lark. I know that. Or a clam, you know, whatever, however you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, let's let's just get into it because why don't you... Start at the beginning of that night, 
And let's skip the history for now, but let's just get right into that night and okay. tell people what you saw from your perspective. Okay. <laughs> well, naturally, this is uh, kind of like a repeat, like a thousand times over. You know? <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, in 1975, November 5th, at approximately 7 o'clock, uh, uh, my crew and I jumped in, in the uh, international crew cab, and uh, uh, the names of those guys are myself, Travis Walton, of course, uh, Ken Peterson, Alan Dallas, John Gallette, Steve Pierce, and Dwayne Smith. Anyway, <laughs> seven of us all together, and we headed out, and... Uh, uh, it was, uh, of course, it was a very rough logging road. Okay, uh, and at first it went uphill so steep that uh, uh, you couldn't have done it without uh, really good traction. I didn't have a four-wheel drive; I had an international crew cab. But uh, uh, I made it up that road, but it was very slow. So by the time we got up, 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 up on the level, it was like 10, 12 minutes later. And, uh, and then, of course, I was up on a on an air, on a air, stretch of road that was a little bit flatter, still going uphill. But uh, uh, anyway, at, while we were at, once we got up on the level, these guys started seeing a a, a light through the trees, and uh, I I you know I had to keep my eyes on the road. My truck was rather quiet. Uh, I had previously knocked the muffler off. But I had a new one put on, so it was quite quiet. And uh, so when we got up, got up around uh, through a dense area, a very thick patch of pines, uh, broke into a clearing. And uh, Travis uh, yelled at me, "Stop the truck!" And without even saying anything more, he jumped out of the truck. Uh, he was on the—I was driving. He was on the front passenger side. And uh, there were four guys in the back. Ken Peterson was sitting right in the middle between me and Travis. Anyway, uh, uh, he took off running. Well, at that point, I, I stopped the truck, and I couldn't see this object. Okay, we'd just come around that thicket and uh, uh, big trees, small trees. Very, very, I mean, you couldn't see through it, okay? Uh, Travis had jumped out. And so I'm not knowing what was going on. Uh, nobody had seen anything yet. I had. They were at, the, at that time. They were. I haven't. I wasn't seeing anything, and so I, I turned the truck off, and uh, and I set the parking brake. <laughs> uh, I and not knowing what these guys were because nobody was saying anything at this point. Nobody. Yeah. Tra Travis is the only one that said anything. All he said is stop the truck, and that's it. So there he is walking up there. Uh, Kind of, kind of a fast walk at first, and then a, uh, uh, and then he slowed down as he got closer. Now, later on, we measured, and and right where he was standing was uh, 93 feet from the edge of the truck. Uh, wow. I just did that by re remodeling the whole thing, you know, putting the same truck there and then getting the tape and, you know, because people kept asking, how far away was that? Well. I decided to make that clear. So anyway, uh, on with the story. Uh, I had to uh, lean over uh, almost in Ken's lap to see this thing. And when I did, uh, uh, I don't know how to, I mean, my emotions at that point were like first blank and then awe. Mm -hmm. And then it slowly became frightening because, uh, about that time, this thing started making a noise, and uh, it uh, at first it was just a, a kind of a, a, a not very loud. I mean, you could barely hear it. It was like a beep at first, and then pretty soon it gained until there was there was both a, a high a high pitched uh, whining sort of sound and a, and a rumble that I could feel through the the handle, you know, the steering wheel, and. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, let me get a drink, right? I get dry mouth, you know, sometimes when I talk. Uh, anyway, uh, Travis got up to this, right? There was a brush pile there, a log, uh, pushed up by logging cats, and it was, it was debris. 
left over. So it was small things and large things all all in one pile. The pile was like, I don't know, 20 feet in diameter, maybe six, mm-hmm. seven feet high. Well, anyway, uh, he got up there and he was standing. Uh, he was he was getting as close as he could to it. And, the, and from, from, from my perspective and looking at the, the angle he was looking at, I could tell exactly where this object was. And so, so could everybody in the truck. And, of course, everybody described exactly the same thing. There's, there's no deviation. Uh, and I don't know if any of you guys have talked to Steve Pierce or John Gallette. They're, they're the only two remaining uh, witnesses that will speak. Now, Ken Peterson mm-hmm. is still alive, but barely, is from what is my understanding of it. Uh, he's, uh, of course, all these guys are a lot younger than I am. You know? yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway including Travis, uh, but uh, this thing was like pretty much above above the slash pile, and it was it was about 20 feet in, in diameter. It was best, my best estimate, somewhere between 15 and 25, put it that way. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it was, you know, you know how it is, like if you see a water tank up on a hill or something, you know, yeah. uh, if, you, if you get up close to it, you're only seeing about one third of its actual size. Because the, your angle of view gets cut off by the edges of the of the of this mm-hmm. cylindrical cylindrical object. Well, that's the way it what is with any, anything cylindrical. Uh, so, so we weren't. It was very hard for us to actually gauge the actual size of it. Uh, but I, I would say twenty feet in diameter. Okay, and uh, it was. It uh, had a framework. In fact, if you have any any illustrations of it which there are in Fire in the Sky and, and things like that. Not the movie. The movie had yeah. great, uh, great departures from the, from the actual story. And, uh, well, Travis stood there um, just transfixed for like five seconds or so. He just had his hands in his pockets looking up at this thing. And he... Uh, got a little bit frightened because you know this thing like i said the sound just kept getting louder and louder and, and more mm-hmm. obvious you know as a time went, seconds went by in fact i've gone through it in my mind several times and that could have taken as little as 20 seconds a minute at most to that to that to the point of him getting hit and uh, so you know he he was reacting to that sound you know plus the fact that the thing didn't fly away, as he explains it. He expected it to fly away. That's why he ran up there, or started yeah. to run up there. Yeah, but it didn't anyway. So he ducked down under the piece of log that was sticking out of this slash pile, and he and he sat there for a few seconds, and and then he was starting to feel this rumble himself. I mean, pretty powerful. It was like shaking the ground pretty hard, and. Uh, and I tell you the truth, at that point, it sounded to me like a diesel engine. If you've ever stood close to a great big diesel train, like a, especially a diesel train, mm-hmm. uh, you'll feel that that rumble. I mean, and it was like that, okay? And and he was feeling that even more than we were. So so he ducked under this log, uh, but of course the log was only like I don't know eight or ten inches in diameter. It wasn't giving him any protection. It was just a reflex on his part. So yeah, uh, he stood up. Because at this point, everybody in the truck, including me, was yelling at him to get back, get away from it. And uh, he uh, apparently took our advice. He, he turned as to leave, and bang, just as soon as he, I mean, the instant he stood up, it hit him. And uh, I didn't see it, because at that point, I had turned away, you know, in apprehension, uh, to turn the truck back on you know because i i felt like something was going to happen and something did and so i saw this brilliant blue green flash i lit up lit up the the whole area brighter than day uh and 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 i saw that you know through the front through the windshield of the truck as as i was turning the truck back on and so i i uh, just jerked my head back around to see him flying through the air and uh, he landed flat on his back and uh, kind of bounced a little. I mean, I mean, he hit the ground hard Mm -hmm. and uh, at that point with everybody yelling at me and everything, and I had the truck on, but I hadn't taken the, 
In fact, they tried to go, but the brake was on the side, <laughs> took the brake off. So it was kind of a, a, a hysterical sort of a thing, you know? And uh, uh, we just took off. And, and where, I'd, I'd, where I needed to go down that road very careful to keep from uh, high centering the truck on a hump. or I mean, we're talking about a really bad road here that, where mm-hmm. bulldozers had gone through and actually closed the road with big, huge uh, four or five foot uh, oh, ridges geez. of dirt, you know, yeah. to block the road. In fact, to get in there, we had to take a shell and, and, and uh, actually dig down one side of these, these uh, ridges in order to uh, get past. So, and, and these things existed like every, uh, every hundred yards, something like that. Oh man. So they meant business. They didn't want anyone going down that road. Right. Well, of course we had to, but, uh, yeah. you know, that was just, just the way it was. We understood that it's something we had to do many times on other jobs and, uh, and several times on that job, different roads going into various parts of it. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I took that road rather fast uh, because it scared the hell out of me, you know. And, uh, you know, I hit some of these humps kind of like wrong. It, I mean, the truck bounced very wildly. You know, our heads would hit the ceiling a couple of times, you know. And, uh, I, in fact, uh, that that jarring kind of jarred me back to sense. And so about a quarter of a mile away, I stopped the truck because I realized but we'd left him there, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, at that point, uh, I got out of the truck and, and then the rest of the guys started piling out after me. And, and when I, when I started to go around the front of the truck, cause we were going to stand the headlight, you know, <laughs> go to the light, right? We were going to mm-hmm. head, we were headed for the, I was headed for the headlights. And, uh, and so everybody else did too. But I looked back and I saw this, this, a light, it was just a light, okay? It was raised up. Uh, you, 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 you could see it barely through the trees, and it raised up, and it streaked away. Well, I wasn't paying attention to anybody else at that point, but uh, a couple of the guys, in fact, I don't know how many, but I remember Steve Pierce and John Gallet both have said since then, I mean, right after that, actually, and ever since then, that they saw the same thing. And, uh, hmm. well... Still yet, all these guys were, were yelling at me, to, uh, you know, what did I stop for? We need to get out of here, see? Uh, I mm-hmm. said, well, uh, you know, we, we left Travis back there. We, I can't do that, you know? And, uh, and so I says, you know, everybody stood in the, in the lights of the truck, okay? <laughs> all of us, there, six of us there. And, uh, and, and it was just like a, I don't know, commotion, uh, you know, just chaos, just... Uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call it. It wasn't really an argument. It was more or less just a, a, a talking to each other in hysteria. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, I told him, I finally says, look, you guys, we're going back. I'm, I'm going back. You guys can stand here and wait or you can get in and go one or the other. And unlike the movie, which has me going back alone. Uh, everybody got back in the truck with me, and we turned the truck around and, and, and went back very slowly. <laughs> so, uh, am I missing anything? No. <clears throat> so, so you get there, Travis is gone. But I want to go back to the sound. Did you ever consider for <clears throat> one moment that it may have been just this huge amount of infrasound that also got you guys you know, all confused and full of fear and, you know, which infrasound does to people. Well, in my analyzation of it, and this is kind of much, pretty much what everybody says, including Travis, uh, we think we think we happened upon them by accident. They weren't expecting anybody to be there, be that close. Right. And what they were doing there, I have no idea. Okay. But, but this thing was hovering, uh, you mm-hmm. know, 15, 20 feet above the ground. And uh, at 15 feet above that slash pile, put it that way. And uh, uh, who knows what they were doing there? I have no idea. But yeah. but but what we saw was incredibly real. I mean, it was uh, totally three-dimensional. There's no way in the world it could have been a hoax or anything like that. A lot of people have suggested that over the years, but uh, especially Philip Class, you know. But... Uh, 
that wasn't a hoax. I mean, there's no way it could have been. And, uh, you know, the only, the only sad thing is we didn't see Travis get abducted. Okay. Because we left, uh, yeah. we came back and he wasn't there. That's all, that's all we really truthfully know about it. Uh, so, there, so, so his story you, is but... pretty much on his own. See, go ahead. Well, when you were there and you went to go retrieve Travis, was there any, you know, anything you remember, like any markings on the ground, any kind of scorch marks? Was there was there marks maybe where Travis was, where he was lifted? I mean, what did you notice when you came back to the site? Well, when we came back to the site, I noticed his uh, footprints, okay? Uh, but, of course, right soon after that, I mean, where he had jumped out of the truck, okay? Because where, where these uh, bulldozers or bulldozer had pushed up this... Uh, this, this pile, they had also scraped up a lot of the pine needles, okay, which just happens with the way that's done. And uh, so it was like a, an intermittent uh, mixture of bare ground and pine needles, you know, and the pine needles weren't real thick there either. Where, where there were pine needles, they weren't thick. Because uh, mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff was in the pile. So anyway, yeah. uh, so, you know, right after... I got out, and and the guys got out, and we went kind of like not arm in arm, but shoulder to shoulder, practically, sort of. You know, <laughs> we were we we would touch each other once in a while, like sh- shoulders or whatever, but but it wasn't like we were huddled together or anything. Uh, but we did go around, you know, and and when we did that through that clearing and then out into the trees, you know, searching for him, uh, uh, we of course messed up all those. Our, our footprints intermingled with his, okay? Mm-hmm. And there were, there, were no burn, there were no barn burn marks or nothing, nothing like yeah. that, nothing whatsoever. In fact, the very next day, I mean, we, we actually searched for him that night with the three of the three authorities, you know, the sheriff, an undersheriff, and a, a city policeman in Heber. And uh, we... Uh, and then of course the next day, real early, like seven o'clock in the morning, there was Arizona sixty, sixty, eighty or more searchers there, which surprised me because they were there even before I got there. But uh, and and uh, when I did, I was with Travis Walton's brother, uh, Dwayne Dwayne Walton, and of course he passed away here a few years ago, and so did uh, Dwayne Smith. And so did Alan Dallas, okay? Yeah. All of, all of whom were younger than I. <laughs> wow. I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I've got longevity in my blood. You know, my grandfather lived to be 98, and my, my, my two of my grandmothers lived well into, way into their 90s. And my grandfather, Howard, died of a strangulated hernia when he was 64. So, uh, mm. you know. Who knows how long he would have gone otherwise, but, uh, yeah, yeah, there, there is longevity there, you know, so I might live to, with today's medicine and, and, uh, all that stuff. I, I've had nightmares of living to 104. <laughs> it's all nightmares, you know? Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. See, anyway. Mike, um, so when you immediately saw that craft in the sky, did you think immediately it was an alien craft or military? I mean, what? What went through your mind? What went what through my mind? What went ass? through my mind was uh, that that it it was alien. I mean, okay, it couldn't it couldn't have been uh, anything that we had. I mean, in the last twenty years, and see, this was forty five years ago. See, in the last twenty years, we have uh, developed some amazing things. In fact, the stealth bomber, the stealth fighter. Uh, and then these uh, uh, jets that can hover in the air and then and then go at like Mach two or three, mm-hmm. you know, those have only come along after that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And those are the closest things that could have been could have even even rival that, and and they don't rival it. There is no way. There is nothing that can of that shape that can set in midair perfectly still. Okay. Mm-hmm. And look like that. Uh, so it was a it was round. The craft was round. Well, yes, yeah, so, yeah, right, round. Yeah, it, it shot. 
just Travis like a, with just a like they say, two two pie pans put lip to lip. That's what it looked like with a with the uh, from what from my angle, we could only see the essence of a dome. Mm-hmm. And of course, Travis could couldn't see that at all, uh, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. so that's the way I painted it uh, once, and then and the second time I painted it from his perspective. Yeah. Uh, and of course, my artistic abilities have gotten better as time goes by, <laughs> like most artists do. Yeah. And, so, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to rush you at all, but you you come back. Travis has gone. You're searching with the authorities. Who called the authorities to alert the authorities that Travis was abducted okay. or, or missing? Well, there are so many departures from the movie. It's uh, it's kind of hard to even say the movie was about this actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, Travis's part was just completely fictionalized. I just don't know why. But anyway, uh, out of our hands, you know. Yeah. Uh, so what was your next question? Well, who who, who alerted the authorities oh, that oh, he yeah. was missing? Yeah. yeah, well, unlike the movie, it wasn't me. It was uh, Ken Peterson. Uh, because we had a discussion on the way back into Heber there, which was, you know, like 15 miles, 12 miles, I think, from from where we actually were and uh went back rather slow uh i was i was just trying to gather my thoughts about it all on that drive back and of course uh in order to do that i had to concentrate and uh and so i i drove half the speed i would have normally driven uh so when we got back in heber uh, uh i told ken i says I, I i can't call somebody needs to call Ken Peterson was fairly adamant about, well, we need to call, we need to call. He's one of those kind of guys, you know, the authority. Mm-hmm. You know, he recognizes authority. So do I, but I just I just wasn't ready, you know, to tell anybody because I, I wasn't certain how to be taken. And so uh, he, mm-hmm. he got out and he called. And within, uh, uh, I don't know, five minutes, uh, the town uh, policeman, I guess you'd call him, his name was... Uh, uh, Chuck Ellison, uh, he came out and talked to us first, and then, you know, about 30 minutes later, Sheriff Gillespie and a, an undersheriff by the name of uh, uh, Ken Copeland came from Holbrook to Heber, and there's a road that goes from Heber to Holbrook, okay? Uh, just luckily enough, I guess, it's just there's one that comes down. But uh, anyway, about 30 minutes later, I was surprised that they got there that fast. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a missing person. So it's rather odd that they re- responded so quickly, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because Ken Peterson didn't tell the uh, Ken Copeland anything about a UFO. Nothing. He just said that we have a missing man. That's all I told him. Mm, that's and, interesting that they responded so quickly. Yeah. Anyway, I, I could hear what Ken was saying because I had my window rolled down and it, the phone booth was, wasn't a phone booth. It was one of these outside things that just has a little roof over it, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and you, you have to stand there, of course, like you do in a phone booth anyway, but there was no booth there. It was just like that. And so, I, I mean, I was like six feet away from, from this, this uh, phone, phone, whatever, phone booth, whatever, and I could hear what he was saying and... Uh, yeah, he didn't say a thing about about the UFO. So when Ken Copeland came out, of course, then everybody kind of kind of told him everything about it. And of course, he, he actually called the sheriff like right away before he even knew about the UFO. So, you know, that to me is rather strange that, that Sheriff Gillespie and them would would come out that quickly. Yeah, that is. Yeah, you know, it was almost like they're waiting. Almost, yeah. In fact, it was uh, would it, it, it would have been caught them early evening, you know, about seven thirty, seven forty-five, something like that. Uh, why would they jump so quick? And they came fully dressed in their uniforms and everything. So it, it's kind of odd, see. And I've always wondered about that. Uh, mm-hmm. But of course, since then, I found out that Sheriff Gillespie believed in UFOs. So when he heard that it had something to do with the UFO, he was like Johnny on the spot, you know? Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, the undersheriff, Ken Copeland, was a terrible skeptic. He just didn't believe a damn thing whatsoever. 
did they think that did they ever think that you guys had anything to do with the the disappearance? I mean, were you guys ever put under the microscope? Uh, Ken Copeland is the only one that thought that. Uh, okay. Yeah, he he kept up with that. He was he was very adamant about it. He had he had like a fervent disbelief in UFOs. <laughs> and of course, up until that night, so did I. I mean, not a fervent disbelief, but a uh, just I didn't know what they were. I'd never seen yeah. one. I'll accept that Travis Walton and I and, and uh, uh, four other people, which consisted of my wife uh, and two of my sisters and my only brother were there. And we saw something that was, uh, and this was five years prior to that. But that was the first thing, really. And uh, it was it was more or less society. And it was rather bizarre, rather strange and, and rather beautiful. Uh, but... Uh, that's another story entirely. But that happened five years prior. By this time, you know, I kind of like thought of that as being something that. This Labor Day, HomeDepot.com is your one-stop shop for all things decor with up to 30% off furniture, mattresses, home decor, and kitchenware. Online, it's a Labor Day savings event. Out there, it's a whole new way to enjoy your space. Whether it's finishing touches or a total transformation, find everything you need to make your home feel more like home at homedepot.com slash decor. Free delivery on select items, $45 or more, U.S. only, valid through September 15th, 2021. Have you got it? The Shields Visa card gives you automatic gift card rewards. You can use the Shields Visa anywhere, and the more you use it, the more gift cards come your way to give you what you're passionate about, like a new golf club, shoes, fishing gear, or whatever makes you happy. Stop into your local Shields store or visit us online to get your own Shields Visa card. Shields Visa. Got it. Tap the banner for more. Uh, we just didn't understand it, so just let it go. I was sort of a skeptic anyway, so uh, I didn't make much much of it beyond that. And uh, so when that happened in 1975, November 5th, 1975, I, uh, I, I was just floored by it, you know, just uh, completely confused. And uh, but I de- yeah. yeah, say it changed your worldview. You went well, from a did, you know, yes. passive believer to these things are truly real. And and not only are they real, but they took one of your coworkers. Yeah. You know, and then, so com- then combined, combined with what we had seen five years earlier, uh, then it became vividly clear. Yes. And you combine those two experiences together, and they are uh, monumental in my mind as uh, proof, uh, at least to me. That, that UFOs exist. Uh, of course, UFO just means unidentified flying objects, which doesn't really mean much of anything. There's lots mm-hmm. of unidentified flying objects in the sky all the time, you know. But when, when you see something that spectacular and that close twice now, you know, at that point, uh, you become uh, a believer, of course. And uh, since then, I've had a couple of other experiences. I, ha- I had something that even rivaled uh, what happened in 1975 happened to me when I was logging on the north rim of the Grand Canyon in, in 1990. And then in uh, 1997, I was in England uh, studying crop circles because that became a very, very interesting thing to me. And I've been there several times. Uh, in fact, the first time I was in England was 1993 to pr- promote the movie Fire in the Sky. Uh, and... Uh, even that afternoon, uh, the afternoon of one of those days we were there, uh, and I can't remember the exact days, just it was 1993, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, my girlfriend and I went off on our own and we went to visit some crop circles, you know, uh, one afternoon when we didn't have a whole lot else to do. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, of course, all we did is observe, you know. I hired a helicopter and went out around and saw a couple of, but we didn't have much time, so we had to get back. Anyway, uh, in the in the years following that, in uh, uh, 94, 96, and 97, uh, I, I went back to England, and uh, I, I even got with some people called the Circle Makers, uh, uh, who uh, were making crop circles. And, and I thought, well, you know, these crop circles are all man-made, right? Well, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So it really yeah. sparked an interest in you. The, yeah, but the... you see, in in ninety seven, in fact, it was the last time I was there because I didn't go back anymore. I uh, I decided after watching these circle makers make circles and how they did it, I decided I was going to make one a little small one. Okay, and so one day uh, I uh, I came up with a design of my own, of course, and uh, and I went through the process of everything you're supposed to do. I, I marked it all out first, which is done the daytime, and you wear clothing that looks does, that blends with the wheat and stuff, right? That's mm -hmm. how they do it, and uh, and I know all their methods. I learned all their methods and everything. So uh, I went back uh, that night. Okay, it was like about one o'clock in the morning, which is when they they do these things between one and one and three is usually the time, and uh, I, uh, I I started going under this fence to. Uh, to go do this right and i had a big roller with me a plank a big roller and a and a plank and board which is how it's done a lot of it and uh so uh as i went under this fence all of a sudden i was struck by a very bright light that was moving around real fast and and i and and then I, because i had spent the day marking out this crop circle on the ground uh, because you know you look at the ground and it's it, it reflection is very very bad so I had these uh, very uh, special I mean I bought them there in England but they were uh, like ultra UV ray uh, glasses you know mm -hmm. and and I had them just clipped on my pocket you know uh, I, you know because I had a hotel room and everything you know <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, they were still clipped in my pocket. So uh, when I saw this bright light, it was it was rather bright. So I so I put the glasses on, and when I did that, I actually saw workings inside this orb, which I estimated to be somewhere between eight and and twelve feet in diameter, and it, it was it was jumping around making a crop circle. So so you go there to fake a crop circle. And yeah. you end up getting <laughs> the real deal. Convinced. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Wow. So all in all, Whammy. I've had uh, a couple of sightings and uh, uh, four very close encounters. No abduction. Uh, mm -hmm. Travis, the only one that I know uh, personally that has been abducted, <laughs> claims to have been abducted. Okay, so you, so you saw this one orb, and you saw it making a story. I mean, continue on with your story. Oh, with that? Yeah. Oh, well, it, it made a crop circle, and, and it did it in like one minute's time. I mean, it just jumped and buzzed around. Uh, it made a kind of a crackling sound, and uh, hmm. I don't know how in the world it was doing it, but I could see very clearly, and I've, I've done several illustrations, photorealistic illustrations. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Interesting. And so yeah. did you did you get scared and get out of there, Mike? Or? No, I, I didn't get scared. I, I've, I've had enough of being scared. You know? <laughs> so I sat there and watched it at least as best I could. Like I said, it was moving very fast wow. and, and jumping around. And it wasn't the only one. There were uh, two or three others over, over a ways. You know, but they were all moving so fast, it was it's hard to see what was going on, you know, because it was dark, uh, very dark. It's like the dark of the moon, I think. And uh, hmm. uh, so uh, the next, I, I I didn't even wait until the next day. I couldn't. I, I, I was, you know, I couldn't go back. You know, after, after this thing was gone, I was so dazed by it, you know, and, and I was so thrilled, actually thrilled by it, uh, that... Uh, and I had to I had to get on the plane early the next morning, so I wasn't able to go back. I just know it made a crop circle. I don't know which oh. one. You know, <laughs> I know yeah. where it was. Yeah. I know where it was. It was actually just beyond uh, what they call it, uh, a, a big kind of a conical shaped mound of dirt that is like maybe sixty or seventy feet tall. I can't remember you, the name of that. Were you alone? Making this crop circle, or did you have help, or you know, was no, there any witnesses? No, no to there was there. No, I was the only one there. Hmm, that must have been strange to see. 
<coughs> Sorry, <laughs> I took a drink of water. It went down the wrong pipe. <laughs> well, that is interesting. Like, it, it, I was just going to say, it sounds like you're the UFO magnet, Mike. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Uh, you know, once you I, see I one, have, you know. I went, I witnessed the Phoenix lights. Okay. But I do not believe it was a giant triangle. Like everybody says, the skeptics, of course, say it was a, a 10 warthog coming back from, uh, somewhere in Nevada, but that doesn't jive with a lot of things either. What I saw was a giant triangle, but it was not, uh, from where, from my perspective, on top of a hill over near Prescott, Arizona, it it was uh, some kind of a hoax, some some lifted by like lighter than air gas or something, and I think it was created by the government. And I've investigated that. Oh man, it's been uh, twenty twenty two almost twenty three years since then. Yeah. And uh, uh, from what I saw, it it was not. Uh, in fact, uh, later on, like the next day, I went looking for things because that night I saw something fall off of it. I went looking for it. I don't know if it was the thing I found, but what I found was a big sheet of very, very thin plastic that was, uh, I mean, so thin, it's like thinner than, uh, this stuff that you, uh, you, you put down on the floor to, covering for, uh, uh, you know, to paint, you know, yeah, these drop, drop off off. things. Super, yeah. super thin like that, right? And it was it was like a, a kind of a gray. You could see through it, but it's sort of gray like. And uh, it was it was ten it was ten feet wide, and the piece I found was well like thirty five feet feet long. Mm -hmm. It was all kind of crumpled up when I found it, but but uh, that's what I saw fall from that. So what does that mm. tell you? What does that tell you? So you're you're believing that the Phoenix Lights were a hoax. It was, uh, yeah, it was I, I believe put it together was. by somebody. Yeah, and I think it was uh, the government had hired like a contractor or somebody. I don't know how they did it, but I mm -hmm. got the I got the impression that it that it definitely was a hoax. A great big. It was like a third of a mile wide. A lot of people say a mile wide. One person even said eight miles wide. No, it wasn't. Uh, because I'm pretty good with with judging things. You know, I've always had really good eyes and a good good ability for depth perception and perspective. You know, the whole thing. And uh, it was it was a third of a mile wide. In fact, I did a what, what you call a, uh, a snap triangulation. It's something I learned to do in the woods when when I was uh, uh, trying to figure out how far away a tree was or how far away a hill was or whatever. You know, you yeah. do this thing which is done rather quickly. And it's like stepping 20 feet to your left, 20 feet to your right, and and then uh, doing a, a triangulation on that basis based on uh, certain markers. You know, it's kind of hard to explain, mm -hmm. but you can find out how far away something is. And, of course, if you do two snaps, you know, you can find out how wide something is. And I did one of those that night. It was done rather quickly, but I determined it was a, about a third of a mile wide. And I determined that it was moving at about 75 miles per hour. So wow. some something that huge, it, it would have been an airplane, could not possibly have stayed in the air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the wind was blowing exactly that speed. <laughs> you know? Gotcha, gotcha. So you think it was being pushed along yeah. by, the, by the wind. Yeah. Within a, few, within a few days, I got all the information I could from the National Weather Service and uh, uh, what do you call it? And that, uh, the oceanic and uh, whatever you call it. NOAA. Yeah. NOAA. There you go. NOAA. Yeah. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, all combined, uh, it said, you know, the speed of the wind uh, and everything. Later on, I got uh, information from uh, the National. Uh, UFO reporting service in in uh, Seattle, Washington, which uh, uh, what is his name? Peter, something. Hmm, Peter Davenport. Peter Davenport. That's right. Yeah, I I can remember things. Any time I try to remember something, I can't. <laughs> it has to be off the cuff, you know. We're getting older, Mike. See. <laughs> <Well, laughs> 
I actually, my, my memory has improved in my older age, believe it or not. Well, I don't know why, but... Uh, well, yeah. I want to, Mike, I really want to hear, before we move on to some, I want to hear about your other encounters, your other sightings. Oh, well, oh, one was uh, in 1968, rather vivid, my brother Charles Rogers and I, in fact, he's my only brother, he... Uh, he and I were logging, you know, working in the woods, and uh, we were cutting. And, and, of course, we would have our, our gas and everything, our lunches in one spot because we'd have to carry it in, you know, a ways from the vehicle. And uh, we were stopped there to gas up our saws and stuff like that because they, well, they would run out about the same time, the car. same identical saws, of course. And uh, I got this funny feeling, and I looked up. And my brother, I noticed, you know, he, he looked up too at that point. And right, and not exactly above it, but, but, but nearly, nearly so, was this uh, silver spherical object. Mm. And, uh, but it was rather high. At first, we thought it was a weather balloon. Because for, where we lived at the time, they, they don't do it anymore, but they, they used weather balloons back then. And uh, I guess they do it all by something else now, Doppler or whatever. But uh, uh, that's what we thought it was. But it remained, and I mean, it was it was rather small. I mean, it was it was like just more or less a speck in the sky, and mm -hmm. uh, not quite. I mean, it, it was a little it seemed to be a little bit bigger than a weather balloon, but it was also silver, and weather balloons are white. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and it, and the funny thing was that it never moved even though the wind up there was blowing rather fast. There was these high cirrus clouds that were above it. It was below that. And those cirrus clouds were moving past it. And it never that moved. That is interesting. It never moved from the spot. Yeah, and I don't think mylar had been invented <laughs> in the 60s. Yeah, well, yeah, this was, this was 1968. Yep. Very interesting. Wow. That's, that's, that is yeah. strange. What yeah, about I, what about the um, sighting you had mentioned in the nineties, Mike? Yeah, that was on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. It was probably the most spectacular thing I've ever had happen to me. And again, I was alone. There was one other person with me, but that person refuses to be spoken of. Okay, confession time. I just finished back to school shopping. Nothing like the last minute, huh? Kohl's to the rescue. I got 25% off a Jansport backpack for my son, $17.99 sew jeans for my daughter, and 50% off Levi's for both kids. Levi's, can you believe it? I even got $10 off because I spent $25 and picked up Kohl's cash. So, yeah, sometimes procrastination pays off. Select styles. 10 off 25 offer in September 6th. Levi's coupons do not apply. Some exclusions apply. See store Kohl's account for details. Uh, which is the case with a, a lot of things like this. But nevertheless, uh, uh, it would take too long to explain it because it's a very long story and a very exciting and, and extremely bizarre. Uh, I don't think we have time to cover that, but I'll tell you something. It was also a sphere. Uh, Can you give us the, um, the log line highlights? Then we'll get you back. I have actually illustrated that twice that that object uh if you if you guys have ever been to my site okay my my facebook page okay mm -hmm. uh, uh most of the stuff is on there and it's all photorealistic stuff man you you have had quite the the encounters you know between the uh 1975 one and then the 68 one and uh the, you know the phoenix lights and then in the you know 19 yeah. say 1990 on the grim of grand uh, uh, by the rim excuse me of the grand canyon you have right. seen quite a few things yes and uh, i'm currently working on two books one is called natural illusions which i began actually not writing but investigating I, was, I became mm -hmm. very interested in illusions because uh, we were accused of, of seeing an illusion, okay? It was just, people would say, it was just an illusion, you know, the skeptics. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, I, you know, I mean, just, just within days after, after that, November 5th, 1975, I started looking into 
illusions. And I found out there's almost no, uh, nothing on it. You know, the actual, whatever illusions is in, 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 in that 45 year period of time, mm-hmm. I have thoroughly investigated and found out that illusions are almost everything. Wow. In yeah. fact, to the, to the extent, I'm not even sure if we exist. That's a Listen, lot to unpack. Oh, heavens, yeah. It's, uh, of course, at the same time, it's damn real. I mean, just try jumping off a, a bridge or something. <laughs> yeah. Gravity alone will let you know just how real this all is. Yeah. And, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, try standing in front of a moving train. <laughs> yeah, you're going to find out really quick. Yeah, people don't you know, even need to be reality. told what's going to happen if they stand in front of a Mack truck or a big or or a train barreling down at 70 miles an hour. You, you don't even need to be told. No. Uh, it, you, you don't even need to learn by experience. <laughs> you, you don't even need to learn by seeing it happen to anybody else. You already know. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, you already know the end result. That's right. Yeah, and you know, uh, what, what so, so this so this world is extremely real, but at the same time, we can't prove it. Prove that you exist. Just try it. Well, you're right. How, how can you prove that you exist? It's sort of like love you or, or feeling, you know. You can't prove it. Sure, sure. Yeah, because <laughs> you have no outside source to validate your existence. I mean, yeah. what you see is perception. and I mean, you know, and so without that uh, third party looking in, there's just no way to prove that you the- exist. That's exactly right. In fact, uh, I have done an awful lot of illusions. Uh, I, I, I will come up with a, a photorealistic, if I can, photorealistic uh, uh, illustration, and uh, and if not, uh, something else. Uh, I haven't gone to photographs yet, <laughs> but uh, mm-hmm. some, a drawing or a painting or, or, or a CGI or something, okay, to, mm-hmm. uh, to illustrate these things. But I've come up with about three dozen so far. I mean, we're talking major, major illusions, and they come in, in several forms. One is natural illusions, which, by the way, cannot be avoided. I mean, you can close your eyes, but that's all you can do. But mm-hmm. natural illusions also happen to all the senses, all of your, your senses, you know, everything. Your sight, your hearing, your balance, everything. And, uh, uh, you know, you can't avoid them. You can't avoid natural illusions. It's, it's hard to explain exactly what they are here. But then, of course, you have man-made illusions, you know, which is like advertising and stuff like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And, then you, and then you have mental illusions. And mental illusions is a huge area because people get all kinds of crazy ideas of things, you know, like, you know, uh, what's one of them, uh, reality, say, uh, well, that's my reality, it obviously yeah. isn't yours. Well, nonsense. Reality is reality, period. You sure, know? sure. And, and so there is no alternate realities. You know, it's, it's just, there's only one reality in actuality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if, it, if this is all but an illusion, going with that line of thinking, then who's the creator of the illusion? Who knows? There are so many unanswered questions. In fact, they're all unanswered questions, aren't they? I guess we can get right down to it. Yeah, you're right. There, yep. Most things are. You, you, you can't prove anything, and you can't find evidence. Uh, I mean, a person's uh, mentality is where it is, and uh, all you got to do is get drunk and find out that you can perceive reality totally different from the way it really is. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I quit doing that when I was, when I was 20, you know, because yeah. I, I like seeing reality exactly as it is. And I don't like that feeling of, of not seeing exactly. I want my sure. perspective to be pure and clean and wholesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Spe- yeah. Spe- I, I don't do drugs reality, of any kind. Right? I don't what? drink anymore. I mean, I haven't for years and years. Matter Speaking of fact, of, I haven't even had a beer in so long, I can't remember. Speaking of reality, Mike, the movie was so far off. So, 
Yeah. When when Travis came back, was he in bad shape physically? Was he in pretty good shape? Can you get into the details of the reality? Because well, I wasn't there. You know, his brother Dwayne uh, had uh, whisked him up. He'd gone. Out. I didn't even know what was happening. He had, they had gone out and gotten him uh, from a phone booth in Heber, and they brought him briefly back to Snowflake, and then they took off uh, almost immediately. Just Travis and his brother Dwayne. Uh, down to the valley uh, to uh, Dwayne's house at the time in Tempe. Of course, Dwayne died here about eight years ago. But, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't even know why or what the deal was with that. Travis has been very, uh, he, he won't even say why, okay? <laughs> but yeah. I, I suspect it could have been drugs. I don't know. But uh, because he was younger than me. I mean, right. In yeah. fact, he was uh, two years younger than me. But nevertheless... Uh, Do but, you keep... Well, oh, well what did you hear about Travis's condition when he came back? Uh, well, I didn't know anything for a couple of days. And uh, and then and then I uh, traveled down there, and, and, and I actually spoke to Travis. Uh, and he was uh, rather... Uh, Oh, gosh, I don't know how to describe it. He was sort of fidgety, but uh, acting a little scared, a little bit. uh, Obviously, uh, dozens of emotions were going through his mind. Uh, He he didn't know he didn't know what to do about anything. I mean, I talked to him, but I didn't get much response out of him. Uh, He briefly told me a little bit about what had happened to him, but very little. And so I left him alone. I, I left there. In fact, I, 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 I started talking to Dwayne about it because uh, Travis, over a period of time, had had uh, told Dwayne about it, pretty much everything. But uh, Travis just didn't say much to me, so I was asking his brother about it. In fact, we, we went outside and walked down the street you know, at night uh, for, for yeah. I don't know, 30 minutes or so, and, and he filled me in on pretty much everything he knew. And that's basically how I how I knew the story. Uh, so, when was the last time you talked to Travis? You mean lately? Yeah. Uh, about four days ago. And he came right here to my house. Gotcha. Well, um, the reason why I bring that up is throughout the years, I, I mean, I, he must have opened up about it with you. Oh, of course, the years. Yes. Sure. You, you know about what what truly happened to him, you, you, you know, and 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 I, I can only just imagine because I'm mean, here. You are, from your perspective, you watch this person just disappear, thin air. Well, you, we didn't see it. We didn't see him well, disappear. Yeah, but you, uh, he disappeared in thin air. Seemingly, you you come back in the truck. Travis is nowhere to be found. Right. Authorities are involved. He t- he's gone for how many days? Three days? Was he gone for three he, days? He was or? gone for, for five days and a few hours. Okay. And the so the he's five days up. is definite. The five days is definite. The few hours is, is skifty. Some, we, we've come up with like eight hours. You know. And, and I guess what I'm leading to is, is throughout the years of Travis speaking with you, what happened on the ship? I mean, what was his experience like? What did they do to him? What did he observe? Well, he observed, uh, he woke up on a table. He's, this is his story, of course. He woke up on a table very slowly, and he saw what looked like doctors around him. He thought there were doctors with white surgical masks, and uh, he was in a lot of pain. Uh, and he... Uh, uh, once, once his vision cleared to where he could see what they were, he was freaked out. That's his words, freaked out because uh, uh, they were these uh, uh, gray, what they call them, grays. You know, mm-hmm. uh, he he says they weren't like gray; they were more more like white, uh, like chalky skin, and uh, and they were about four feet tall, approximately. And and he and of course he's uh, six foot one. Then I guess I think now he's about six foot. <laughs> but uh, he uh, he jumped up from the table. He says and uh, he grabbed uh, 
like a clear plastic tube of some kind off a, off a back wall there. And he started lashing out with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't hit anybody, but uh, they uh, had their hands outstretched, like, don't stop, that sort of thing. And they had five fingers, okay, but they were very small, like a, a baby's hand, you know. And uh, he says they uh, they just all of a sudden went out the door and to the right. He said there was a curving hallway out there, a very narrow one, which which he, there was barely enough room for his shoulders, one side or the other, to fit down this hall. And, and the ceiling of it uh, was touching to the top of his head, okay. And he said that he, uh, he, he went down it to the left, which means that it was curving to his right. And uh, he came upon a, an open doorway and went into this room, which you could see the inside of the room and everything. There was a chair, a strange-looking chair, sort of a pedestal-looking chair, metallic, uh, in the middle of the room. He said that he, he kind of sat, sidled down the side of the walls there you know first uh, so he could see what was in, inside the somebody sitting in the chair and no, nobody was so when he started approaching the chair the room started dimming at the same time and by the time he he got to where he, could, he was standing right by the side of this chair he was like he was standing in space he could see all the stars all around him through all the walls behind him below him above him the whole shot and I've illustrated that too. You know, I've illustrated all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, anyway, he says that he was, uh, he sat in the chair trying to figure out, uh, the buttons didn't seem to do anything. Uh, there was a lever on the chair. He, he moved the lever and it kind of rotated the view. He didn't feel any motion where he was, but it rotated the view. So he didn't know what to think of it. Uh, and and then he then while he was in there, uh, he heard a, a noise behind him, the same door that he had come through. He uh, jumped up, and, he, and it, the the guy looked like a like a human being, except that he had a helmet on, you know, like mm -hmm. a not like NASA, but a totally clear bubble-looking thing, had a kind of a frosting on the back side of it. But other than that, it was. Uh, Rather plain, connected to a black uh, thing that sat down on this guy's ch uh, uh, shoulders, and uh, he was wearing a skin-tight blue uniform. The uh, aliens that he had encountered earlier wore a brownish-colored, uh, loose-fitting sort of thing, but they but they did look like uniforms because each each of these little guys wore the same thing. And uh, this guy wore a blue tight-fitting uniform. And he said he was packed with muscle, literally. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Did, did he see, like, I've always wondered with people on the ship, when they're, when they're on the ship, and maybe he never mentioned this, or maybe you don't know. At Acuity Insurance, we believe the things you do for your business every day are nothing short of heroic and you deserve someone equally heroic to protect them. Like the breaking ground on new construction things, the every box and barcode matters things, and the driving the family business forward things. We put our all into covering your business so you can focus on the things you love most. That's the power of heart. Acuity Insurance, wholeheartedly for you. Have you got it? The Shields Visa card gives you automatic gift card rewards. You can use the Shields Visa anywhere, and the more you use it, the more gift cards come your way to give you what you're passionate about, like a new golf club, shoes, fishing gear, or whatever makes you happy. Stop into your local Shields store or visit us online to get your own Shields Visa card. Shields Visa. Got it. Tap the banner for more. Were there other abductees there? Was he aware of other people, or was he alone? No, with them? He, he never saw anything. Okay. But this uh, this guy, whoever he was, uh, let him out of this thing. He went through kind of an airlock first, you know, and then and mm -hmm. then out. And there was a, a ramp leading down from this thing, which which looked just like the thing that we saw see in the woods. Uh, and 
he said it was as larger, like maybe 35 feet in diameter. I don't know. Uh, it could have been the same craft. I don't know. Uh, but he, he knew, uh, and we've done a lot of speculating on that since I, I drew a diagram of the ship, which is in his book, uh, which, uh, I, actually both books. In fact, they're both the same book, really. Uh, the Walton experience came first and he had writer's mm -hmm. block. So I helped him write the first two chapters. Of course, he elaborated on it from what I did, but it did break the block. And he, then he started writing, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, Fire in the Sky is just uh, basically a repeat. There's a lot added to it. Mainly, uh, he put down Phil Class for 70-some pages that took him to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, anyway, uh, where are we now? <laughs> I get off on a tangent here and yeah, I lose track. Yeah, no, you're talking that he was... Uh walking down a ramp and uh, and then uh, yeah, of course yeah, he was right. he was in the he was let out the room well and, he was uh, uh found himself once he was he found himself in a very large hangar type area where there were other craft that looked like him like the one he came out of and some others that looked uh silverish and oh like an oval and and silver in fact highly reflective and then uh uh he says that he went into a he walked across this large area, uh, which which was like hangar inside, a huge hangar, and uh, went into this other, through this other door that was like a hall, and they went down the hallways, and then in, a, in another door, I think it was to his right, and when he was in there, he, there were uh, uh, two other human, you know, another man and a woman. And the the woman was rather busty, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. and and but they weren't wearing helmets, okay. And the guy that had brought him in there uh, left, and so he was just there with these these two human-looking people, a man and a woman, who, who were both very good-looking and both. Uh, I mean, the guy was muscular. The woman looked muscular, but you know the way a woman would, you know. Mm -hmm. And and uh, they didn't have helmets on. None of the, uh, no aliens of any kind, the Nordics nor the Greys ever spoke a word to him. Not a single word. He did say that. That's one thing he's always uh, uh, reiterated about and, yeah. uh, you know, actually elaborated on that they never would say anything to him at all, not even it's telepathically or anything. Yeah, just total silence. And, uh, and anyway, the, these two humans, Nordic types uh, laid him on a table, and and the woman put a a, a clear plastic oxygen mask looking thing over him, and uh, he went out, and that's the last he remembers until he woke up on the highway, uh, approximately I don't know an eighth of a mile out of Heber, up the hill. Wow. Jeez. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, see, all that is detailed in his actual books. You won't find it in the movie. In fact, mm -hmm. the movie is a complete departure from all that. Total, uh, completely yeah. made up. Uh, they don't. It's not even the same looking aliens. It's not the same nothing. Complete yeah. departure. Were you disappointed in the movie? I was disappointed in Travis's part and my part. I wasn't. I mean, Robert Patrick played me. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. We we became good friends after that. But how it turned out, I mean, the movie. Oh well, it was a, it was yeah, like a. Know, it sounds it like wasn't, you were, It wasn't a you blockbuster, know. but it was a major movie. Mm -hmm. Fire in the sky, and of course, uh, then they sent us on a, an international promotional tour for it, which included England and uh, mm -hmm. uh, what, Rome. Italy so and, what I'm Aust getting and at, Australia, among others. But yeah, what, go ahead. What I'm, what I'm getting at, Mike, is, is that, you know, I mean, you knew the movie was a, a vast dis departure from what your actual experiences were. Uh, did you almost feel like they didn't listen to your accounts and they just kind of went on their own route and made oh, it different, like you said, a different movie altogether yeah. than we did, what really we happened? Did lots, yeah, we did lots of radio shows, TV shows, you name it. I mean, it was it was like crazy there for a long time, and, and everybody was asking the same question: 
how close was the movie? Well, mm -hmm. at the time, I was under contract to Paramount, okay, for this sure. promotion, which which paid rather well. And uh, uh, so I kind of had to hedge my thoughts a little, you know. So I did a whole lot of humming and hawing, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't want to upset the people that butter your toast, man. Well, that's so, exactly I mean, right, you, yeah. You, you, you know, so I understand that. But I couldn't lie. I couldn't lie. So a time or two when people would ask me a point of a question, I'd say, no, it's not the same story at all. <laughs> eventually, Paramount, they had all kinds of things. They had Japan uh, on the schedule and other things, and they just suddenly canceled it for both me and Travis uh, because uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't lie. I just couldn't lie. And uh, they were expecting that, so... so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Australia was the last, the last trip we made. It was a fantastic these, trip, though. All these years later, the movie's been out since '93. You're obviously not under contract anymore anymore with Paramount. Am I correct? No, huh? i have not. So you can no, say whatever you want at this point. Yeah, that's you know, absolutely about, right. I mean, I could go through. I, I could, I could trash that movie. I can tell you that there's only three names they actually used in the movie. Mm -hmm. And only six characters, not seven. <laughs> yeah. And and everybody went back, you know, to find Travis, and and uh, they never they never they didn't follow anything correct. I mean, absolutely nothing. If you if you if you go through that movie, not one word spoken, not one thing that that happened is act was actual, mm -hmm. not the way it actually happened. Mm -hmm. Especially that, that happens a lot in movies, I, I, and uh, I know that I'm a good friend with the Perrin family. That the Conjuring movie, the first one, was made after. It's a horror flick that's out there, and she had mentioned the same thing that they took, you know, there's vast creative liberties with the movie, yeah. you know. So vast. it was like, wow, none of that even happened, and and it's in the movie. So I get that. That does happen. I mean, they got to make something entertaining too, you know. Right. So yep. You know, I, I understand that their point of view as well. That's right, and uh, I don't know why they do that. I think it's because they want they want originality for one thing, which is nonsense. If you're going to make a story and you're going to call it based on a true story, do it. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and and that's what everybody expects. But they won't do that. They won't. They won't even come close. It's a it's a matter of originality and combined with this fear of lawsuits. Sure. They they have to completely change it to keep people from suing them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and still be profitable. Yeah, well, I'll tell you this: it would have been much more profitable if they'd have made it closer to the real story. I agree, I, and I and I, I I've heard that from I mean I heard that until the end of the world. You know, if they would have just told the movie, if they just made the movie the way it really happened, or at least close to it. The movie would have been a blockbuster. Mm -hmm. It did pretty good anyway, but but it would have been a a huge success. Yeah. But they just can't. They just can't because they got to have their originality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did did they even give you guys the lie detector test, Mike? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, they gave all of us a lie detector test uh, on a on a Monday. You know. Uh, on the sixth day after this happened, they gave us a lie detector test down there in the county seat of Holbrook, Arizona. Uh, and uh, there's a lot to that. But, uh, yeah, all of us but Alan Dallas passed the test. And we found out later, after I got into the police records, which they at first refused to give me, it took me several attempts to get the police record. But when I did, uh, th there was one in there that said that Alan Dallas had actually passed the part of the test that he took. You see, they do three run-throughs of these things. And uh, at least this guy did, because uh, he was very thorough. Uh, and uh, and he became a believer on account of this. But he wasn't before that. Nevertheless, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Alan Dallas had two run-throughs that he actually set through and actually passed. The third run-through, he passed the part right up to where he quit and tore himself loose from the machine and stomped out. And Alan told me this, the examiner told me this, you know. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, nevertheless, uh, 
All but Alan passed the test, and Alan passed the part of the test that he took. Why did he stomp out, do you know? Uh, apparently, he I didn't know it at the time, but apparently he had robbed a store or something. It was, it was, it was kind of like that. It was sort of a hoodlum, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew that. In fact, I had had a fight with him uh, about a week prior to that where I pretty much kicked his ass, you know, because he had stolen the headers off a very expensive automobile, a racing automobile that my brother owned and had uh, parked in my backyard. And uh, and he stole those headers and he took them. I, I went looking for them. Once I found the headers were missing, I knew who took them. And, and uh, in fact, uh, one of the other guys told me that Alan took them. So I, I went chasing for him through town and I finally caught up with him. And I had a fight with him. Uh, you know, he... He got pissed at me and he threw the headers down at my feet, you know. Mm -hmm. He had to go into another guy. Apparently, he had sold them to this guy. He went in there and, and, and took the headers back, you know, whatever happened there. Anyway, he threw them at my feet and that kind of pissed me off, you know. So I says, Alan, uh, why in the hell are you mad at me? You're the one that took them. And he started calling me names. So I busted him in the mouth. And then we got in a fight, and uh, he eventually ran across the street <laughs> and started yelling at me. You know? yeah, but uh, he, I blooded his mouth and everything. Uh, wow. Anyway, So he stole your exhaust headers. Yeah, he, this nice. was, like I say, a, a week before. And so he came, to, he came to my house that night and says, do I still have my job? And I says, well, Alan, I didn't fire you. <laughs> I says, if you're there in the morning, I'll pick you up. We'll go to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeez. Wow. <clears throat> so, so when Travis was gone for five days, he must have been dehydrated or hungry unless they fed him. So what, I mean, what's, what explains the fact he wasn't hungry when he got done? Oh, well, I don't know. I wasn't there. So you know, I can't answer those questions. I can only say what he says. He he apparently didn't eat anything during that time, or drink anything. Was so food or water offered? I'm sorry, Doug. Well, he would have been hungry then. Oh yeah, he was ravenously hungry, and he also very dehydrated. And uh, so he and, was. Uh, his his brother Dwayne says that, and of course there was a doctor Kendall that investigated. You know, checked him out, and he says that. Uh, he was, he was, well, of course, he wasn't as dehydrated by the time Dr. Kendall got to him, but, uh, but he was dehydrated. And that, of course, is Travis's and his brother Dwayne's uh, testimony on that. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this stuff goes by what other people say. You know, I, I can't vouch for a lot of these things. Right. A lot of hearsay. Who? I said a lot of hearsay. You're hearing it. Oh, yeah, hand. definitely hearsay. And, of course, as we know, in a court of law, hearsay don't mean much, does it? Mm -mm. It depends on whether it's a firsthand account or somebody else saying, this is what somebody told me. That kind of thing is actually cast out of court. If you have a good lawyer, they'll say, you know, that's hearsay, Your Honor. <laughs> I watched Judge Judy. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've studied the law. I've actually I won a couple of lawsuits, uh, not licensed, but I, but I won them just the same. <laughs> anyway. uh, and, you know, you get the pride from that, right? Mm -hmm. I know the law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Travis at this point thinks he was helped. <clears throat> you know that he was injured, and they took him to basically put him in a hospital. Uh, you mean, you're talking about the aliens? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's why. Well, he his, his, his theory is, his idea is that, yeah, that we happened on them by accident, which is what I think too. And, uh, and the, they picked him up because he had, he had inadvertently injured himself by running up there, which was totally unexpected. I mean, I can see that very easily. They didn't even know we were there. Mm -hmm. They had something important to do there. And here we are, all of a sudden we just break past that clearing and there we are and Travis immediately jumps out and runs up there. Uh, or at least pretty much runs up there, right? And uh, and, and he gets right up under them and he says, when he and it happened right when he stood up. So we don't think that it was an intentional beam. We think it was like uh, static electricity or something. You know, and, and hit him and, and probably killed him. 
because he looked dead when he hit the ground. That much I do remember. I, I didn't see the beam that hit him, but I, but I saw him hit the ground. And he hit rather hard. Hey, Randy, what you doing? Oh, hey, Dave. I'm just making a list of things that make me feel really, really good. Wearing Bombas socks. Trust me, that's number one on my list. Bombas socks feel so good because we use the smartest design and best materials, making them the most comfortable socks ever. Plus, because socks are the number one most requested clothing item in homeless shelters, we donate a pair for every pair purchased, and that feels pretty good, too. To shop Bombas or learn more about how your purchase supports those experiencing homelessness, go to bombas.com slash comfy and get 20% off your first purchase. Enviar nota de voz al group chat. Buenos días, ¿quieren desayuno de McDonald's? Gidget dice, eres la mejor. Un sausage McMuffin, please. Laura dice, sí, sausage McGriddles para mí. Ale dice, ya comí, pero me traes un hash browns, love you. El, mi colega favorita, tío. Llévate todos tus favoritos de desayuno como un sausage McMuffin por unos pocos dólares, solo en el one to three dollar menu de McDonald's. Precios y participación pueden variar, no puede ser combinado con un combo meal. Uh, so, I know for, I pretty much know that, that uh, they took him to fix him. That's all I can yeah. say about that. Yeah, so I they mean, saved his life. Oh. Well, that's what makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it all does make sense, doesn't it? It does. It does. But how has this changed? I mean, obviously, this has changed your life, though. I mean, de you know, really deeply, you know, both from a, a believer standpoint and notoriety. And, 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 uh, has, do you think that experiencing what you experienced changed your life for the better? Or do you wish you never would have seen this? Well, there isn't any second guessing that, is there? What happened, happened, and that's all mm -hmm. there is to it. <laughs> Uh, Very true. It hasn't been bad. It hasn't been good. I don't know how to equate it. You know, I don't even know if I exist. <laughs> so, <you know>. yeah. <laughs> uh, do you, do you have a feel, Mike, for how many, like people in the town or people you dealt with after Travis went missing, uh, and who believed you and who didn't? I'll believe tell you what. It really divided people. It became a polarized situation right off the bat. Uh, I would walk down the street and I'd have people actually spit at my feet. And then I'd have people come over and offer to buy me coffee or breakfast or something. Wow. You know, uh, it was like that. I completely polarized. It seemed to be like 50-50. And I think the statistics today show that. You know, it's, it's like, well, it's... It, it, you know, the popularity or the belief in UFOs has obviously gained in in, uh, in statistics, you might say. Yeah. I don't even know what the percentage is now, but I know at the time it was like less than half. Uh, within 10 years, it was like half. I don't know what it is now, probably up around 60 or 70 percent. Or more with the government saying, yeah, we're not alone, coming out and admitting oh. They know that much for sure. Now, I don't think they know much more than we do, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, why would these entities uh, tell the government something they wouldn't tell people? I mean, why? Mm -hmm. I, I think it is they don't tell anybody anything, to tell you the truth. And I think those people who say they do are hoaxers. Or they're just simply uh, off on some mental delusion. I'm sorry, but that's just the way I think it is yeah. because I'm a realist. And my KGRA radio show that I had here uh, up until about six months ago, and I still would have continued it, but that's a different story. Uh, I, the, my show was called The Realist mm -hmm. because that's what I am. I'm basically unbiased. I look at everything the way it really is. I, I I only care about the truth for what is the truth. Yeah, yeah. Well, what are well, you, what are your what are your theories, Mike, on aliens? I mean, what what are your thoughts? What do you think they are? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I've never seen one. I've seen their crafts a number of times, but uh, what they're doing, I. I have no idea. What in the hell are they making crop circles for? I mean, for one thing, that or that mutilating just cattle. Me. Or mutilating uh, cattle. 
I don't What's believe the they are mutilated. I don't believe they are. I don't believe they are. There is absolutely no proof that they are. In fact, there's no proof of anything, is there? Hmm, that yeah, yeah, we kind of circle back to that, don't we? Yeah, That's I mean, right. Really, ultimately, there's there's no truth. And when and when, when somebody when somebody says they know, I'll guarantee you they don't. We don't we That's don't know much of anything actually. We know what we see. And we can doubt yeah. that even, okay? Yeah. And uh, that's about it. Yeah. Well, believe half of what you see and a quarter of what you read. <laughs> well, I would say you can't believe, a t uh, you can only believe about a tenth of what you read. <laughs> and sure. and I, I have some, some rather bizarre looks at, uh, you know, seeing as believing. You can't, you can't believe in what you see. At, uh, for instance, uh, people like 200 years ago, just 200 years ago, people thought the moon was just beyond the clouds and made of Swiss cheese. You know that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's statistical, right? <laughs> well, what do we know about the moon now? See, you, you can't go by, uh, by what people say. Yeah, you know, but back then we weren't as learned as we are today. We didn't we didn't have the technologies right. we have. Exactly today. right. We and, and we didn't and go so up there what, and actually land. So on what it. what technology do we have now? It, it's still in in uh, b the baby stage. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about aliens, about extraterrestrials. We have no concept, and I don't think the government does either. It's true. Very likely true. What else do we want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> the weather? I'll tell you something. It's uh, it's hot here right now. This is northern Arizona. Phoenix is, is reaching uh, 100 and, uh, 110. Uh, and, and the weather has changed. Uh, what, what Republicans used to say about the weather, they would say, uh, no, no, it's all the same. It's just, it's just changes, right? Well, we haven't had a snow here in four years, and we used to have five feet on the level right where I'm standing, right where, mm -hmm. I'm, where my house is, okay? Yeah, it certainly is changing. The weather sure does seem that way. It's not well, the patterns it used I'm, to be. I'm glad it is changing because I'm sitting right where a 400-foot-tall glacier once was. <laughs> that is true. Wow. A, a, a prehistoric ocean. Yeah. So, yeah, it's changing. Yeah, so, and, the, and the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, has not existed. Uh, it's only 12,000 12, years old. If it's real. Yeah, if it's real. <laughs> well, I know it's there because I went to Australia and I went swimming on the Great Barrier Reef. Do we okay? truly know, Mike, it was there? Well, not really. We really don't know anything, do we? In reality, we just don't know anything for sure. We can come up with concepts, but that's all we mm -hmm. get is a concept, a well, perception. And it's all mm -hmm. mental, isn't it? I understand. I'm coming to your way of thinking. Everything you touch, you feel, you smell, you taste, that, that right. all could be nothing more than just a grand illusion. Well, it is, because everything that we see, everything that we feel, everything that we hear, balance, taste, the whole shot. Uh, it's it's delayed for one thing. Mm -hmm. it, 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 we perceive these things because they hit us in the eyes, the ears, the, the sensory perceptions, and then they travel through these uh, tiny electrical impulses. Then they finally get to the brain, and then it's analyzed, and then you know, it, it, you know, all that stuff is. Uh, I don't even know how to explain it, it but it's uh, it's a process that you know. Like light, for instance, it comes through the eyes, and and all we see is that is that part that's reflected directly to our eyes, and then mm -hmm. we have to focus it, and that goes through the, uh, the optical nerves to the brain, you know, which by the way travels at the speed of a horse-drawn cart. <laughs> Sorry, I researched all this stuff out, and then of course the brain takes it and rehashes everything. Sight, for instance comes to the brain upside down the brain has to flip it over okay? mm -hmm. and uh 
And as far as balance is concerned, you know, actually balance is one of those things that uh, they left out of the five perceptions, you know. There are actually seven, okay, <laughs> not five. And uh, anyway, balance is is more real than just about anything, yet they left it out. So like what you saw that night with Travis Walton could be nothing more than you didn't experience anything. It's possible. I have to admit yeah, you know, that it's, so, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's. I understand what you're saying. I, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down, Mike. Yep. Of course, at the same time, I think I remember when I was born. It's kind of hazy, you know. <laughs> but I, but I do remember from the time I, I remember my first birthday and my first Christmas very vividly. So, so you know, kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, I've always found it interesting that more and more. Um, scientists are saying we might be living in a video game well sort of it's not a video game but of course something well, like you, that you know what i for, mean for one thing yeah. as far as you go down or up you cannot find the end of existence no. at the same time you can't find exa exactly what it is the, well, the, fir me. the first thing that blew my mind when i was a kid my dad told me big goes on forever and so does small that's exactly right. And I went, ooh. Endlessly. And the same with yeah. time. Time has no beginning and it has no end. Yeah, and that's... So where the hell are we anyway? I don't know. We're, 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 we're both traveling on the same spaceship, traveling yeah. at 25,000 miles an hour through space. <laughs> that's right. And you're that's sitting right. on one end of the spaceship and I'm on the other end. At the same time, if you look at the sky, right, the stars in the sky, the only reason we see those stars is because of what you call light flare, which is, and I've calculated this out, 3,228 times an object looks that much closer and that much larger than, than the object really is. You know, and stars are huge. They're, they're, they average about uh, a million miles, in, excuse me, The sun is 870-some thousand miles in diameter. That's, that's pretty big, you know. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And uh, uh, anyway, it's uh, 93 million miles away. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, yet, you know, when you look at the stars at night, right, the sky would actually be jet black if it wasn't for light flare. So in reality, that's a huge illusion, isn't it? Because if it wasn't for light flare, we couldn't see a single star. In fact, even the planets, if, if, light, if it wasn't for light flare, we couldn't even see the planets. And the moon would be a dim, dim, pale, pitiful thing we could see, but it would be very dim and, and it would yeah. look smaller. And I've come up with a whole lot of illusions based on the stars, the moon, the sun, uh, all that stuff, uh, I've researched all that in depth, and I've done illustrations for all of it, and I'm working mm -hmm. on a book called Natural Illusions. Okay, I'm also, Mike. I'm also Mike. working on a book called <laughs> okay, the Adventures with Close Encounters. So, Joel, I've got a question. Don't answer yeah. this, Mike, because I know you know the answer. How long are the little stripes mm -hmm. on the freeway? Oh, well, if you're doing 70 miles an hour, they look like they're three or four feet long, don't no, they? Mike, but, but, oh, but if you Mike. stop and you pull over and you look at the them, they're somewhere between 15 and 25 feet long, depending on, you know, where you're at and what what they decide for that particular state or highway. I wanted Joel to try to answer it. Here's another you mean thing. the lines on the highway that no. you see? Yeah, the dotted in the lines, middle? yeah. Yeah, the the middle, lines, yeah, they're well. I used to paint them, so they're eighteen inches. <laughs> yeah. So you know how long they are. <laughs> Nevertheless, no, yeah, not wide length. Length, length is eighteen yeah. inches. Length. It doesn't uh, matter how wide they are. They five are five inches. Yeah, they are five or six inches long. Sometimes four. I don't know. It depends. You know, uh, around here where I live in the White Mountain area of Arizona, they. Uh, they they used to be twenty feet long. Now they've shortened it up to mm. fifteen. <laughs> okay, but you know. Yeah, the interstate uh, system. I guess that's is the same thing, right? 
Yeah. Highways depends on your state where you live too. You know, that's yeah. kind of like a state by state thing. Yeah. But a standard highway, not an interstate, not a you know, not a major freeway. They're they're eighteen inches by five inches. Eighteen inches long. Yeah, by five inches wide. Eighteen inches long. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen that. They they have shortened them a little. Uh, they went from twenty feet to fifteen feet here, in this in this particular area, on the highway. Wow. We're not, we're not talking freeway. We're talking sixty mile yeah. an hour, sixty five mile an hour uh, highways. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I ran past my time here. Uh, yeah, it's uh, six thirty one right now. So. Uh, well, we're uh, glad you came on, Mike. Yeah, well, Mike, I better thanks. I better cut it off here. Uh, like I say, I can call these guys, but uh, they wonder where I was. <laughs> anyway, sure, sure, I'll make my excuses, right? Like, oh, it slipped my mind. <laughs> there you go. Just tell them it was just an illusion, the meeting, and it really doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right. Doug thanks. and Joe, we'll uh, yep. we'll talk to you again soon, hopefully. Okay. And uh, sounds great. We'll, uh, well, thank you, Mike, for we'll coming on. There. You bet. All right, guys. Bye-bye. See you. Bye now. Okay, confession time. I just finished back-to-school shopping. Nothing like the last minute, huh? Kohl's to the rescue. I got 25% off a Jansport backpack for my son, $17.99 sew jeans for my daughter, and 50% off Levi's for both kids. Levi's, can you believe it? I even got $10 off because I spent $25 and picked up Kohl's cash. So, yeah, sometimes procrastination pays off. Select styles. 10 off 25 offer in September 6th. Levi's coupons do not apply. Some exclusions apply. See store Kohl's account for details. This Labor Day, put an end to junk sleep. Right now at Mattress Firm, save up to $500 on our top-rated brands when you get a king bed for the price of a queen or a queen for a twin. Plus, get a free adjustable base when you spend $6.99 on Sealy or save up to 50% on hot buys from top brands like Sleepy's or Serta. With our highly trained sleep experts and our low price guarantee, you can rest assured you'll get the best bed at the best price. Unjunk your sleep only at Mattress Firm. Offer valid with qualifying purchase. Restrictions apply. Valid at participating locations only. For offer details, visit mattressfirm.com slash sale. Well, that, that was quite the interesting discussion. Yeah, we're doing the reverse show. We are doing the reverse show. What do you think, Doug? What do you think? Everything's illusion? Nothing matters? Nothing's Don't real? Don't know. It's possible. Okay, I got a story, though, that, that really haunts me, that kind of goes along with, you know... I mean, Mike likes to philosophize. You know, he's, yeah. he, he missed Clearly. his call. Yeah. But... But there is something weird that happens to me every day. It's like every day. This isn't something like, oh, I experience this weird thing every week. It's every day. Okay, so I have a stop sign at the end of my road. Okay, yep. And there's a parkway. Every time I pull up to the stop sign, there's always somebody waiting to cross. Yes. Or zoom, or they'll zoom their bikes, you know, right in front of me. Yeah. But here's what gets weird. If you look down both ways, I mean, you can see for a mile down the one side, you know, and maybe a block down the other. You don't ever see anybody. And so, so like, well, only until you arrive at that stop so sign. Moment, so, so my favorite line to say every time I pull up is cue them up. Cue them up because I'm up. coming. Cue them up. Here I'm coming. I'm, you know, I get like 30 feet from the thing, from the stop sign, and I go, cue them up. And sure it's every day. So I pointed this out to Yvette yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, because, you know, I'm just like, I want to bring someone else into the mic, you know, my weird mind. Yeah, just so you can verify yeah. that this is truly going on. Because it, I've been, this has been going on for 10, 12 years. And I've kept my, you know, I've kept my mouth completely shut. <laughs> but it's like it's so it's not like maybe consistent you know, a little bit it's every day every single day yes when you leave your home there, you just, cannot see anybody at all but the many minute you get to that stop no, no, sign no no, no 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 i'm saying they cross in front of me and then i look both ways and they're gone and there's nobody for a mile what the heck where are they going no, no, no! You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not picking up what I'm throwing at you. Uh, I, I it's think like I am. It's like they were queued up. Yes. A movie. 
Because yes. there's nobody there. In other words, if I'm not pulling up, there ain't nobody walking. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. But it makes bike. me yeah. wonder. Okay. Because you were saying that you could see a mile each way. Well, not but once each they cross. One, way, one way I can only see maybe two blocks. One okay. way I could see literally a mile. Gotcha. Gotcha. And there's nobody. And there's nobody. But if until I pull you up, I go, up, if I go out of my house right now, get in my car and go to that stop sign, there'll be somebody waiting to cross. And, and what, what have you, I know you're a deep thinker, but have you thought why this is happening? No, it's just that I notice things like this and it makes you go, dang, it's kind of like one in the pocket of Elon Musk where he goes, you know, we're living in a, in a video game type, um, what matrix. do they call it? A simulation. Yeah. And there are more and more scientists that do think we are living in a simulation. Okay. But who's simulation? There's got to be a point to the simulation. It's Otherwise, probably a it's not a simulation. It's probably a simulator simulating the simulation. Oh, boy. I, I don't meta. know. Boy, is that ever meta. You're going to make, make my head explode. But okay, it's just, but, I just notice weird things. Uh, like I, I, you, Maybe you're kind of like on the Truman Show. Except yeah, this like is the Doug Truman Show. show. In, in, and there's a grand illusion master. That no, is, but if it happens day after day after day for 12 years and you're like, but there's never anybody in the have, park. Okay. A, you have way too much time on your hands. That 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 is just way no, too no, much time no, on the old I hands. Too much time be... on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, I'm going into Mike's world slowly. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. No, but don't, you know what I mean? It is, I know exactly it is, what you mean. Find it out. Everyone for 12 years could be a coincidence. Could well, be. you do live in a major metropolitan area. I realize that, but literally, when somebody, you pull up to the sign and it's Zoom. I know, I'm trying to rationally you work look this both ways out with you. There's nobody ever coming. I know, that's what you're telling me. It's like they're queued up. It's, it's like it, the movie Funny Farm. Right? Right, you know, where they had the whole town, you know, like queued up, ready when these people were going to come look at their house yeah, to buy. Yep. Yeah, it's like I that. Know exactly what you mean. Yep. That is strange. That 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 is strange. And and and, how do you feel, Doug, when you see the queue up happen? I don't know what to think. I just notice them. The more I notice it, because I don't think let's let's just say. This happens to everybody. Nobody else would notice but me. Yeah. Yeah. You're I the just, one guy. I that take would... no. Yeah. I yeah. Because most of us are too busy with our day to day lives to really take note of that. You know? Oh, my. I mean? Oh, my God. No, oh, I'm, I'm just saying. You, I'm you busy, know, but I'm a thinker. You know, I know. I know. That's what I'm saying, though. Most of us, you know, because you're a deep thinker and you observe everything around you, you know, don't think it that way. And that's what actually, I'm trying to I'm say. Not, actually, I'm not a deep thinker. I'm more of a ADHD type thinker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Gotcha. It's like, boop, 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 boop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like a squirrel. You yeah, know, I'm like a squirrel. You, you, or a yeah. seagull. <laughs> no, don't don't call yourself a seagull. I wouldn't do that. No, they're flying rats. No, oh no. But Dude. I know what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying. There are just some oddities in life that make you stop yeah. and take pause, wondering why. How is this working, and why is it working this yeah. way? Yeah, you do wonder. And or there could be we could be in a partial simulation. So. Okay, for instance, when you play a video game, which I'm yes. sure you never do. Oh, I play video games. Okay, so let's say you're playing an open architecture game where, you know, there's the whole world where you can roam, like, it's, it's called you a know, open Grand Theft world. Auto or one of these yeah. Western yeah. games. Or, yeah, you know, a whatever. sandbox game, yes. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> they, don't, they don't use any of the computer-generated thinking to produce anything other than what you're looking at. Yes. So the world doesn't exist. 
until, until it's rendered. You, yeah, until yeah, till you look that way, then it renders. Yes, that's what a lot of people are. Scientists are starting to think that the world renders as we look at it, as we observe it. But I, I, I so, don't know. So it could be a hybrid situation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I know. Now, I know exactly what you're really saying. really here. The moon is there, but the moon's not there until you're looking at it. <laughs> it's just yeah, space yeah. until someone observes it. Well, someone's always looking at the moon, so it's always being rendered then. Yes. Yeah, but, but, yeah, I but know what you're saying. But only for them. Well, because, no, them. you're getting back to perception as reality. I'm getting back to Mike. Is what you're saying. Perception Champion. is reality. What you're perceiving is your reality at the moment. Right. It doesn't mean it's my reality. I have a completely different reality. What I'm saying is if everybody turned away and didn't look at the moon, it would not be there. Maybe. Well, that's kind of like the old, does the tree make a noise if no one's there to hear it when it falls? Right. That's me. I'm that guy. You know, does it make a crack? In other words, okay, energy costs energy. It takes energy to create energy. To, to When you look at something... It's, there's energy even from your eyes hitting it. Maybe nature and the whole universe has figured out a way to conserve energy, just like a computer does, computer memory, by not mm-hmm. generating it if it's not needed. It goes into a sleep state when it's not needed. Yes, just like my pedestrians. <laughs> just like They're not pedestrians. needed because I'm not there, so they're not really there. I- I tend to believe that the world exists. Me too. I I, I tend to believe that there are people experiencing a lot of things in this world on their own because the perception, again, is reality. But I also understand that things do exist even without mankind being there because we have proof of it existing before man even came here. Yeah but, yeah, but what you're saying is, how do we know if no one's looking at it? <laughs> fossil records. Uh, yeah, but if there's no one here to, here to see the fossil <laughs> I records. I understand. See, I'm never going to argument no because it, it's always going to be that perception thing. It's well, always going to be that it's, until you look at it, does it exist? You know, and that's fossils what, or okay. anything else. But, but what I'm saying has kind of been proven in some ways through quantum physics. You know, they... You know, the the, uh, slit experiment, Mm -hmm. where if we're not observing it, the photons don't follow the slit. They go out random, as if the slit isn't even there. Yeah, yeah, it's the manipulation of the uh, the observer. But the moment we look at it, no, listen, the moment we look at it, oh, I guess I got to behave the way I'm expected to, because you see the slit, you know the slit is there. And then, and so that's been proven, and that's mm-hmm. similar, and that's what really got scientists going. Maybe this is kind of rendered as we need it. Mm, true, true. So and there's so some is, proof. So, so is Schlesinger's cat. Well, yeah. No, I it's Schlinger. What's the, you got the name wrong? What did I get it wrong? Yeah, I'm some, sure I'll be corrected. It's something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm having right. a brain. Very you know. deep. Very deep stuff. Yeah. Very deep. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, all these answers might be given to us when we die. Yeah. yeah not you. Know. Just me. J- just you. And that's yeah. good because, you know, why not just you? But anyhow, <laughs> we're not important enough. When you die, Joel, you're going to turn into iron ore and poof. No, no, no. <laughs> see, see now that's, that's, I've seen ghosts. Yeah, well, we don't know what they are. No, they could be, but I, I know consciousness could, transcends. No, it could right be now. memories too. There could be memories that are causing them to be there. Okay. I'll tell you a story about a, I'll just tell you this story. So my son moves into this new home, right? Pretty new house, 10 years old maybe. It's not haunted. No one died in it. Mm-hmm. And he keeps seeing this little dog 
up on his bed. It jumps up on his bed. It, you can feel the weight of it. He sees it night after night after night. Gets glimpses of this little chihuahua. They end up meeting with the owners, and Blaine goes, did you guys have a little chihuahua dog? And they're like, yeah, we did. He's Blaine's like, is he alive? And, and they're like, yeah, oh, yeah. So was he seeing... He was just seeing the memories of that dog in that home. Or the dog imprinted imprinted on the environment. With that yeah, energy. the environment. That's what I mean. Yeah, it's like a memory. You know, it's, it's, it's like, like, a, uh, like a tape. Yeah, tape. yeah. What you're talking about is, well, because the dog's alive, but, uh, you, you know, you're talking about like a residual haunting that's playing over and over right. and over. Right, but and if over. the dog would have been dead, everybody would have said, oh, it's a ghost of the dog. Y- yeah, no, yeah. No, I understand where you're coming from there because that, that is documented. That can happen. Uh, minerals will cause it to have quartz, iron ore, things like that that hold energy have been known to promote that kind of activity. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I mean, so, we don't know yeah. what it is, but it is fascinating. That could it be is. Crypt, that could be what cryptids are. Ooh, I mean, I get people that call me up and they go, "Uh, I just saw a giant beaver." <laughs> you know, like from the place to see near. You know, and they're yeah. like woodsmen. They're trained. They're an outdoorsman, a survivalist, and they're calling me up, going, "Uh." I did see a giant beaver. Like this thing was the size of a grizzly bear. Yeah. They, well, I believe they believe they saw it. Yeah. Y- y- you know, I but mean, who am I to say? Did. They didn't maybe it that. was just one of those memory residual. Or it could have been a complete misidentification. Oh my God. That's what I just said. The guy, this guy's That's like, no sad. way. I saw its tail. <laughs> I saw it. No, it, I tend to believe him. Yes. No, I, 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 I would believe them too. Who the hell, who the hell makes up a story? They see a, a giant beaver. <laughs> well, nobody would. Who would make up that story going, hey, by the way, I was in the woods, and man, did I see the biggest beaver ever. It was the size of a Yugo. Yeah, exactly. You, you, nobody's going to make but that But people up. are seeing giant sloths. They're seeing even dinosaurs, and you know, at times. Yeah. Giant deer. Yeah. You know, all these places seen animals have been seen. <clears throat> Bigfoot. Maybe Bigfoot's just a memory of a, you know, some crazy caveman. That would explain the lack of any real physical body sure. evidence sure. of a Bigfoot. In other I words, mean, maybe there's so many layers of dimensions at different times and they just get, they get glitched. We know that there's many dimensions that have stacked on each other. And, and I, I believe that they intersect here and there once in a while. Yep. Where we'll, we'll, we will experience the other dimension. And that could explain Bigfoot. And that could explain Loch Ness Monster. And that could yeah. explain Mothman. That could, could explain ghosts. Ghosts yeah. very well could be human beings on the other side of that dimension. Right. Witnessing you, believing you're the ghost. So it's, it's, it's really, it keeps going and going and going. It was, it's, it's something that we are far away from understanding or even coming to grips with. Right. You know, but I think there's definitely something to it. And so do a lot of other people. Because they're experiencing things every day, like your giant beaver man. <laughs> it just, you know, I get, it's just, when you get calls like that, they sound so ridiculous. But you listen to the witness and you ask well, them. You also get a lot of calls questions. that are complete bull crap, too. I mean, yeah, well, this, too. I know, but I'm just. This guy was serious. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that there's a lot of things we don't understand. But again, it's 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 really strange what's going on right now. Especially, it seems that there's a shift going on. Yeah, because I, be. I notice there's a lot more people seeing Bigfoot. There's a lot more people seeing aliens. There's a lot more people seeing. <laughs> Ghosts. There's a lot dog, more people see dog this. Man. Dog man. Dog man popped out of nowhere. You know, ten years ago, no one knew what a dog man was, and then, then well, I suppose maybe longer because it was. Uh, uh, we had a. Uh, uh, oh, geez, she's out of Wisconsin. I should really know this. Um, yeah. She's a good. Actually, she's a good friend of mine. 
Linda Godfrey. That wrote e. Linda Godfrey that wrote the book, and and after that, it really seemed to take off. Dogman. Some people claim they've seen him. Other people, you know, claim that they've actually had encounters with it. But there again, <clears throat> you know, fantastic claims require fantastic evidence. Right. Well, I was on my deck sunbathing one day. Yvette was there. Beautiful day like today. Kind of cool, but sunny. She starts screaming, and I look, and there's like a black orb, best way I can describe it, right next to the deck. <clears throat> I grab my camera, go to, you know, to film it, and the thing took off, you know, and made it to the clouds before I could turn my, you know, the button on the video. I did get it sailing around the clouds, zigzagging around the clouds. That is strange. And and at least yeah, and I got, I did get video of it, but um, not not what we saw, because <clears throat> what we saw was you know kind of breathing, you know, it was like changing shape, and I don't know. Wow. It was yeah. This poor I'm, Yvette. Four you know, this, four feet from my head. <laughs> this 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 poor lady. Let me tell you, she's been through a lot. Yeah. Just you tell talking about it on the show. She has been to the ringer and back. Well, what are you going to do? Stuff happens. It doesn't happen often, but, you know, when you see something like that, like what happened to Mike, it's not as traumatic because it's not 60 foot wide, but it's still kind of life-changing because you go, wow, gee, are these things running around out there at night everywhere? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Do they kill you? Can they kill you? Can they zap you? Are they harmless? What are they here for? You know, your brain is just going. Yeah, yeah. What's well, then the purpose? It, well, then it gets what's weird, Joe. So we go in the we you know come in the house to get out of the sun. Actually, go in the garage to look at the video to see if I did get it, and I did. Go back out, and here comes another one out of the water this time. Shoots wow. out of the water and just goes straight to the clouds. Out what of, do you think they were? I don't know. I have no idea. But, you know, when you hear about the way you know, that the military is going, yeah, you know, it came out of the water, went into the water. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I that, knew that. that is, was kind of that's amazing. That, that yeah. is amazing, especially if you've had, you know, witnessing something like that. Yeah. Both well, you, you and what Mike talked about. Yeah, you know, you well, know. it's nice to have a witness when you see mm -hmm. something. It's nice to have it on video. Yeah, yeah. But having a witness and having video definitely adds that, uh, you know, I'm not crazy factor. Yeah, yeah. You, no, I know you, I'm you know. crazy. Um, but you do wonder what what it's all about. You know, what what was it doing that one day? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What that? was its purpose? I mean, what was its... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it you, it makes you wonder. One thing I did find interesting, she goes, she goes, well, I watched it go around the pine tree in the yard twice. And at first, she thought it was a balloon, right? A black balloon. Came to the, the, the deck. She still hadn't said anything. She's still thinking, you know, like, what is this? She pulled her head back, kind of like, you know, when she realized it was real, wasn't mm -hmm. a balloon. She said it did the same exact thing, like it jumped back and jerked back. Was it, it must have react? was it reacting to her? Do you yeah, think? reacting to her. It mimicked what she did. Oh, man. You know, and she, you know, and then she's like, uh, she can't even get words out. And she just starts kind of, I don't know, all woman tries to get your attention yeah. i call it yelling <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you know not really screaming but you know like look 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 you know and i'm like i'm looking at her going well, what am i supposed to look at I turn yeah around right and there it is blacker and i mean it was the blackest thing i've ever seen hmm so th there you are how how far away were you from her when she experienced would you say 
foot. We just had a, a little, uh, um, what do you call it, a uh, nightstand or a deck, you know, like a deck table between us, between the mm-hmm. two chairs. So you got a really good look at it. Well, yeah, I mean, you could have, yeah, if you would have had a rake, I could have smacked it. Yeah. Definitely. Sounds like it's definitely energy based. I don't know. And it had like um, a texture, <clears throat> kind of, uh, I wouldn't say scales, but very fancy texture on it. Like, uh, Do you remember Paul Eno when we had him on? Yeah. And yeah. he had mentioned this black mass was in this home. And he it had texture, and he and he felt it, and it felt like it had chicken bones inside of it, is what he'd said. Yeah, I gotta listen to that again because <clears throat> I remember when he told me that. I'm thinking, dang, if that thing would have been in my house, you know, it was fine. It was outside. Yeah. But if I was to come around the corner of my home and see that thing standing there floating. Oh, ooh, man. ooh, that would be, or in the middle of the night, picture two in the morning, getting a drink of water. And, yeah. and there it is, hovering. I think right there, that'd be the end <laughs> of my heart. It would just seize up. Yeah, yeah, I saw a, 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 a demon one time like that. Yeah. Coming around the corner, and there it was. Some kind of black thing. It was just a black, hideous mass. And just oozing ill intent, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is not good. I don't know. You don't know it was a demon, but you yeah. could feel. You could well, feel. I had the sulfur smell, and I had the. Oh the really? Bit. Yeah, that comes with. It was. It was when I was working on oh, a demonic case. Okay. Stop now, because I had something happen to me when I was a kid, that did involve a sulfur smell, and something really cool. So it is weird that that, you know, you mentioned that. So it was, I believe, our first time that we'd ever been left alone as kids because my sister was older. <clears throat> and we cleaned the whole house by my parents because they went to a what, what we had heard was a nightclub. Mm-hmm. Either a nightclub was, but that's, that's yeah. where the parents were going to, a nightclub. So we cleaned the whole house. We mopped the floors, we vacuumed, we were going to surprise them. We're sitting at the table and we got done cleaning. And I smell this. It smell like a lit match. Wow. She's like, oh, I don't smell anything. And all of a sudden she goes, oh, my God. And then I couldn't smell it. Then she couldn't. Then I couldn't. Then she couldn't. I said, we need to check the, home, the house, you mm-hmm. know, to look for fire. And so we searched the whole house in the, up, you know, the upstairs. We didn't find anything. But we would keep getting a whiff of sulfur. It was really weird. So I said, we need to go in the basement. Something, you know, because our basement was totally unfinished. There's boxes down there. And so we go down the stairs. We get to the end of the stair with the wooden stairways. And a fireball shoots right in front of us, moving from left to right. Hits the wall where the pool table was, the only thing we had down there, and all these shower sparks come down. Then another one comes behind that one, hits the wall, and shower sparks. And you can imagine where we went back upstairs. Yeah, very quick. I'd be hightailing upstairs as well. But but we smelled that sulfur. Weird. Man, that is really weird. And sulfur's always associated with like evil and yeah, yeah. But it's also associated with aliens and all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The sulfur smell is generally not good to have around. I mean, you know, you smell it, and you know, it's not really something you want to run into. But when did you start, it sm- smell, yeah, does it smell like matches, Joe? Like it a lit match? Like sulfur and rotting flesh. Okay. But it, it didn't smell like um, more like a rotten eggy kind of sulfur no, or, it, it, it or really smoke. Sm- the only thing I can compare the smell to was sulfur. And I remember years and years and years ago, when I was much younger, I came across a dead deer carcass that had been there for two, maybe three weeks. 
<clears throat> and it smelled just like that dead deer carcass. You, you know what the scientific name for that is? That, that smell? That? It's what called pustocene. Really? Well, it's that's, disgusting that's smelling. Scientific name, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Which does yeah. involve sulfur. Sulfur compounds. Yeah. Yep. So that that was that was jarry. But then you guys seen fireballs racing across your yeah. unfinished basement, smash and going to the wall and then leaving in sparks. Yeah. That that as a child that would be traumatizing. But but what I don't get about things like that is you would think, oh okay, well I'm gonna see those things every day. Never seen them again. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what's yeah. weird about the paranormal repeat. Yeah. Yeah, repeat, you know, we love it if it repeat because if you can repeat you can you can study it. Further, yes. further, and then it becomes repeatable, which does become scientific by nature. But, but don't you, when you see something, I always think in your mind, oh, I'll see that again probably because I just saw it once. Yeah, but it yeah. Never happens. Yeah, never happens again. No, no. Either you're lucky enough that it doesn't, or you're unlucky enough it doesn't. Depending yeah, on your point exactly. of view. And and so yeah, that's the paranormal. It's it's all strange and so for me say no to seeing anything in the house <laughs> yeah right you don't want to do that but i that suppose takes Doug, away. The, well it takes the, away all your insecurity or all yeah. your securities it does once it's in your home where you relax and you're yourself mm -hmm. there and it's in there with you you're done i mean it's you're you don't feel ever like you can be safe again true that yeah. So we got we got to get out of here, man. All we, right. We end of another show, and it was great having uh, Mike on. I mean, really deep stuff, and we heard uh, really quite a fantastic tale about what he encountered in the woods with Travis Walton. So, but I also want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in, making the show go. Doug, I want to thank you for being such an awesome co-host and love working with you every week. So. We will continue that. Until next time, guys, take care of each other, love each other, and check out the skies. Maybe you'll see something. Acuity Insurance, we believe the things you do for your business are heroic, and you deserve someone equally heroic to protect them. We put our all into covering your business so you can focus on the things you love most. That's the power of heart. Acuity Insurance, wholeheartedly for you. Have you got it? The Shields Visa card gives you automatic gift card rewards. You can use the Shields Visa anywhere, and the more you use it, the more gift cards come your way to give you what you're passionate about like a new golf club, shoes, fishing gear, or whatever makes you happy. Stop into your local Shields store or visit us online to get your own Shields Visa card. Shields Visa. Got it. Tap the banner for more.